just look at the history of everybody no, no. doing big projects, and it's never driven by exploration. It's never driven by science. It's never driven by curiosity. Not if it's big and expensive. It's driven by the fact that people don't want to die. So there's a war driver. It's also driven by the fact that people want to get wealthy. So no, no, a hold money on. We have the Large Hadron Collider. Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider. Do you know? Oh, no. No. <laughs> It feels good to be a gangster. A real gangster ass nigga plays his cards right. A real gangster ass nigga never runs his fucking mouth cause real gangster ass niggas don't start fights. Perhaps the most famous image of Hubble is a close up of this zone right here, which has been variously be called the pillars of creation, God's fingers, and all sorts of other sort of religious references. People feel that way when they look at images of the cosmos, of course. I was always curious though that in the same universe you have things like the underbelly of a tarantula and when magnified no one thinks religious thoughts when they make those <laughs> observations when it's it's part of the same universe let's take a look at something real quick cosmic abundances of the elements ranking them top to bottom most abundant to least number one in the universe hydrogen cool number two helium very nice number three oxygen Four, carbon. Five, nitrogen. My favorite element of them all, other. Okay, so then, <laughs> how about life on Earth? What's the, what's the ranking of elements in life on Earth? Well, all life contains water of some kind or another. Water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. So hydrogen's got to be pretty high up there. Sure enough, it's the number one element in life on Earth. Uh, What's next? Oh, no, we don't actually have helium. Remember, helium is a noble gas. It does not interact with anything. So helium is not in life on Earth. You could inhale it, then you sound like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> By the way, Mickey owned Pluto, okay? <laughs> Which is an abomination of the mammalian order. <laughs> Dogs eat mice, okay? So I had to get to the bottom of that. I called up Disney and I said, how is it that a mouse owns a dog? What goes on there? And he said, okay, if you are a creature in the Disney pantheon and you don't wear clothes, you can be owned by others who do. <laughs> Pluto is butt naked and walks on all fours and does not speak. Whereas Goofy, also a dog, wears clothes walks bipedally, speaks, owns a home, pays rent. That's the difference, okay? I know you're burning to know this. Okay, next most abundant ingredient, life on Earth, oxygen. Next, carbon, in order. Next, nitrogen, and together class, other. We are one for one the same ingredients that appear in the universe. If we were made of like an isotope of bismuth, you might say, hey, we're kind of, we're different. We got something different going on down here. Excuse me. We are the same as the universe. And these elements are forged in the centers of stars. This is actually an image of the center of the galaxy, but there's stars within here that forge those elements, explode from what we call supernova explosions, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy, enabling freshly born star systems to contain the basic ingredients of life itself. And this is going on in every single galaxy across the universe. If I can, we can dim the lights for this, the last two images. The, this is our nearest large galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy. It happens to be among the stars of the constellation Andromeda. That fuzzy spiral contains 400 billion stars. These other stars you see in the picture are sitting on our nose in our own Milky Way. It's as though we're looking past a screen door through the void of intergalactic space to another galaxy. If you pull out the power of the Hubble Space Telescope and say, I'm not going to look at this big galaxy. I want to look at an uninteresting corner of the dark night sky and show me what's there. This is what shows up. This image has three stars in it that happen to be sitting on our nose. One of them, if you can still see me, is right here. They have spikes, 
Another one is directly over me here, and there's one at the top. Every other smudge, every other shape in this image is an entire galaxy from nearby to the distant universe. Every single splotch on this image. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. That's what it's called. And you sit here and gaze upon it and recognize that every smudge is like our own Milky Way, containing hundreds of billions of stars, some of which are forging these heavy elements that comprise life, exploding, scattering themselves into their own galaxies. And it is this knowledge that we have of the universe and our knowledge that we have of chemistry and our knowledge that we have of biology that allows us to derive the conclusion that no, we are not apart and separate from this universe, we are one with it. I can say one better than that, not only are we one with it, because these elements are forged in the universe and they become part of life as we know it. It's not simply the fact that we are in the universe, but ladies and gentlemen, the universe is in us. And I know of no more profound understanding or revelation that modern science can deliver but that. And for me, that makes me feel large, not small. Thank you all for this evening. I want to make an important point. This is not all people in the world, this is Americans. Religious people, the, you, it depends on which study you get, you ask, do you pray to a personal God? These numbers vary, but they're high and they're up around 90%, okay? It might be 85, that's actually not important, that difference is not important for the point I'm about to make. It's high, okay? In the West, in America, 90%, okay? What percent of Religious, what percentage of educated people are religious? The number drops. I'm talking about graduate degrees here. Among all people with masters and PhDs, the religiosity drops. Somewhere around 60%, might be 65. The point is it drops with education level. Now let's bring in scientists. How about what percentage of scientists in America are religious? The average over all the branches, it's about 40%, maybe 35%. Uh, in there, there's a range, of course. Biologists, physicists, astrophysicists are lower. The um, sort of engineers and mathematicians are higher. So you, it averages out to about 40%. So this looks like, this looks like scientists are 40% down from 90% from the general public, but that's the wrong, no, it's 40% down from 60% because all scientists have graduate degrees. So the graduate degree in any subject gets you halfway there. The science is the increment from the educated degrees. I mean, from the um, all educated people. That takes it down to 40%. Now you go to the elite scientists. This is a well-known number. 7% are religious. Claiming a personal God to whom they pray and intervene in their lives. I submit to you that with the current atheist fervor that has taken on over the past several years, I would say launched, the modern atheists are called, launched by the Dawkins book and the Hitchens book and the, and the Sam Harris book and the like. And I was just in Borders recently. Couldn't believe it. I was, I didn't, I, sorry I didn't have a camera. Borders books, there it was. A section called Atheism. It was like, I'd never seen that before. It's like, okay. <laughs> there it was. They had enough critical mass of books to make a section. So, here's my problem, here's my concern. When you're educated, and you understand how physics works, and you're mathematically literate, and you understand data, and you understand experiment, and you go up to someone who doesn't have that training, and they are religious, and you ask them, why are you religious and believing in invisible things that influence your life? What's wrong with you? Okay? That's unfair. It's not only unfair, it's disrespectful. For the following reason. Until that number is zero, 
You've got nothing to say to the general public. These are scientists among us in the National Academy of Sciences who are religious and pray to a personal God, and I know some of them. And you're fighting the public for the religious beliefs? Figure that one out first, because maybe there's an asymptote. Maybe you can't change everybody. Maybe that's telling us something. Maybe there's something in the brain wiring that positively prevents some people from ever being an atheist. And if that's the case, in a way, they can't help it. And you'll never know it because you're not one of them. So I ask you, first, for compassion with the public, but you should target your exercise and your experiments on understanding that number. Because that's not zero. Yes, it's low, but it's not 1%. It's not one half of a percent or a tenth of a percent. It is 7%. Uh, if he's about to be executed. Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. And so people at the time, led by people such as Voltaire, asked the question, if there is a God, and we had this tsunami that killed 80,000 people and wiped out a holy city on a holy day, collapsing churches onto people's heads, then either God is not all powerful or God is not all good. If we define good by being interested in your health and longevity, that's a fair definition of being good, I would think. And so that, that created an entire philosophical rift in the theological community, and people parted ways at that time. So when I look at the universe, and I see asteroids coming down to strike and rendering species extinct, I see forces of nature that would just as soon have us dead or extinct. I don't see the goodness in the world that people speak of. And am I, am I being selective? I, I don't think so. A tsunami hit Indonesia, a quarter million people died. The earthquake hit, hit Haiti, a quarter million people died. This is nature. So when people define God in that way, I don't see the all good part. I see some good, I see a lot of bad. Nature trying to interrupt my health and my longevity. I wrote an essay some years ago called The Beginning of Science, in part as a rebuttal to uh, John Horgan's book, The End of Science. Yeah, I, maybe it's because in astrophysics, we are so much closer and have daily reminders of our own ignorance that you would just simply never get an astrophysicist to say, science is coming to an end. It, it just won't happen. We're too exposed to what we don't know. Who is to say there's not some yet to be discovered law of physics that would give us a deep and intimate understanding of dark matter or dark energy or multiverses or, uh, we're just not there yet. The 96%. The 96%. <laughs> if I don't know what, what's driving 96% of the universe, I'm the last one on your list who's gonna say the end of science is near. Uh, it looks pretty much like the beginning of science to me. I'm going to appeal to you in a way that most people don't. I'm going to tell you things other people are not telling you. You get people who are space enthusiasts, let's go into space, it's our destiny, it's our next, great nations do it. And I look at history and I say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Here's what we got to do. We've known since the Industrial Revolution and earlier that innovation in science and technology 
Yes, it'll help defend a nation. But when you're not at war, you know what else innovation in science and technology does? It is the engine of tomorrow's economy. The engine. When Einstein wrote down his equation for the stimulated emission of radiation, which is the foundation of the laser, was he thinking to himself, barcodes? <laughs> <laughs> this is innovation in science. The applications of his ideas into machines requires the clever engineer, creative investors and, and dynamic CEOs turn it into product. Don't ever tell me why are you studying this? How is it helping me? You know, I don't know how it's going to help you. I have no idea. Neither did Faraday. He just knew you would tax it. Neither did Einstein. Neither did anybody who made great discoveries about our understanding and our relationship to nature. Now, first of all, it's the same God, OK? God of Islam and God of the Old Testament. It's the same, Allah is the same as the God of the, it's the same. So hold that aside for the moment. Hold that aside. What he did not know is that of all stars that have names, two thirds of them have Arabic star names, okay? Now, I don't think that's the point he wanted to make. I think he, 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 he didn't quite get that. And so, he, you know, here they go. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Not all stars have names, but two-thirds of those that do have names have Arabic names. There we go. Okay? There they go. And you might say, well, how did this come to pass? What, where did that come from? What was going on? Because if you think of the Middle East now, and it's not where, you're not saying, hey, these are folks naming stars. You go back a thousand years, Islam, 800 to 1100. In that period, which is generally called the golden age of Islam, of Islamic science, golden age, true, go there was no greater golden age in the history of the world before or after. When you look at the some of advances that came out of that period in Baghdad. Algebra was invented in that period. Algebra is itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Our numerals are Arabic numerals. You ever wonder why? You ever stop and think why they're called Arabic numerals? In that period, mathematics took great leaps and bounds. Agriculture, engineering, medicine, navigation, navigation. Navigation. Star maps were made to assist navigation. Astrolabes were, create, were crafted. Then it all stopped. It ended. It ended. If you're a historian, typically you, are, you're, you, are, you focus on history as marked by changes of kings and leaders and wars. That's the lens through which many historians look at the past. And so if you ask people, they'll say, oh, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, and so that's why it all ended. If that were the only force operating, then later, when the Islamic culture rose, you would still see this tradition of scientific um, uh, uh, innovation. But it has not recovered. It has not come back at all compared to what was going on in that 300 years. And what you do is you, you read the writings of al-Ghazali, who is a, a Muslim cleric, and he, he was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. What he did was he taught you how to be a good Muslim. He taught you how to read the Quran and how to obey the commands. That, because back then, people were just interpreting it for themselves. He came along, he was a, an academic scholar. He interpreted the Quran. He said, this is how you must do it. First had social influence and then political and cultural influence. 
And basically, his interpretation took over. And in that interpretation, it included the perspective that the manipulation of numbers is the work of the devil. This cuts the kneecaps out of any mathematical advances that would unfold. Math is the language of the universe. If you take that out of your personal equation, you no longer contribute to the advance of human understanding of that universe. And that absence of Muslim presence in the frontier of science persists to this day. Take a look at the Nobel Prize from 1900 to 2010. I can do this, do this for the, for the Jews, for example. How many Jews in the world? There's like 15 million tops, tops, 15 million out of seven billion people. These are the numbers of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize in the sciences. 25% of the Nobel Prizes. We have a Jewish person in the audience, congratulations, okay, <laughs> fine, okay. <laughs> this is rightly something to be extraordinarily proud of. The traditions of Jews in the 20th century is one of, of education and scholarship. Uh, in earlier centuries, it was one of very strict sort of uh, um, uh, study of the Torah, did not involve the natural world. This was a later emergence of the Jewish culture to exhibit this. Let's look at the numbers for Islam. So these are Jews. There are 15 million Jews, 25% of the Nobel Prizes. There is 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. These are the numbers. Two and a half. Okay, I'll give you three if you really want to include economics as a full number there, okay? <laughs> if you got to give it a full number, okay, I'll, okay. <laughs> now, for me, by the way, you can analyze this in any number of ways. There are 50 times the number of Nobel Prizes, 180th the population. There's 4,000 times the impact. I lose sleep at night with the question, how many secrets of the universe lay undiscovered? Because 1.3 billion people who in an ancestral time would have participated in this enterprise and are now not. That's what I think of as a scientist. Whole populations. By the way, there are other populations that never contributed. I'm not going to them and blaming them. I'm talking about a population that already did contribute. It's in, it's in the cultural heritage already. All we're asking is to resurrect it. It, is, it has not happened. So the question is, he saw one of my talks where I spoke of when you, the research scientist, so do you carve your way to the edge of what is known and un, so there's a boundary there between what's known and what's unknown. Now you want to push that boundary by asking questions of the unknown, and that's how discovery unfolds. And in that lecture, I commented that there are some people in society who will invoke either a deity or what they call intelligent design as an accounting for things that we don't yet understand on the premise that we will never understand it. And I asserted that those people are not useful in the laboratory. Whatever it is they do in life, the lab is not a place I need them to be. I need the people in the lab to say, there's something I don't understand, I'm going to solve it. That's a different kind of mentality towards the unknown, and those are the people who make discoveries. Okay. How to survive 2012. Tactics and survival places for the coming pole shift. Pole shift? Where, where'd they get that from? I don't, the pole? The end of the world? In there is the Mayan calendar? Because clearly the Mayans knew more about astrophysics than any of us do today. Clearly. And wait a minute. Next Saturday. Whoa, next Saturday. Whoa. What country is this? What millennium is this? So what's interesting is originally they said the world was going to end May 21st, but then 
that was revised. And so apparently the 21st is only Judgment Day. So Jesus is coming on the 21st. And I'm guessing that he's really pissed, okay? So, <laughs> at human beings. So five months later is the asserted end of the world as evidenced right here, the end of the world. And there's not much sand left in that clock. You can, you can translate this into any language. There's an audio reading of this, and you can get the printer-friendly PDF version of this account. <laughs> what country is this? I'll show you where this comes Oh, oh. Answering the question, did human beings, as we know them, develop from an earlier species of animals? This is simply evolution by natural selection. So if you're this, so this is countries ranked, sort of Western countries and countries that are otherwise developed by the modern use of that word. So if you're this sort of the green bar, it means yes to that question, which means that ev you're convinced by evolution. If you're this sort of amber bar on the right, it means no. And if you're the white in between, it means you're unsure. So America's got to be up there somewhere. No, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, France, Japan, Britain, Norway, Belgium, Spain, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Hungary, Luxembourg, Iceland, Slovenia, Finland, Czech Republic, Estonia, Portugal, Malta, Switzerland, Slavic Republic, Poland, Austria, Croatia, Romania, Greece, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Latvia, Cyprus, United States of America, edging out Turkey by a nose. There it is. What country is this? Maybe. Uh, about impasses? They're not impasses. That's just science. Don't look at it as a problem, look at it as science. You know, there's the delusion, the, the delusion that science is about discovery. It's, it was never about this. Discovery, that's what gets reported on in the press, but the press doesn't report about all the days in the lab where discoveries aren't happening. They don't report about all the blind alleys that you don't know are blind until you get to the end of the alley. That's the process of science. That's the trajectory that we're all buying into here. Emotionally, physically, culturally. If you don't like the dead end, find something else to do because most of what you do will be dead ends. And your ability to intellectually navigate to the side of them, beneath them, over them, around them, into another direction is the measure of how good a scientist you are. In fact, if you happen to luck out and have projects that worked out for 10 different papers in a row, you're not being trained as a scientist. Because the day a problem happens, I don't know what you're going to do about it. Whereas everybody else, we had to gut slog through and had to redo a problem because they made a wrong assumption or the lab specimen got contaminated or and they didn't know it until later and they read the lab book and they find out that the cleaning person came in and, 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 and pet the mice in the lab, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you find out later and you lose a year of your life. You actually didn't lose a year. It's just more of the process of science. You're buying into the process. You're buying into the journey. You're not buying into the product. And not enough of the public understands this. The public thinks we just discover stuff. In fact, your dead end, you publish that dead end. If, if you design the experiment correctly, that's going to be an interesting dead end that he doesn't have to take the next time. He looks into that same problem. And he's going to reference your paper. <laughs> Okay, not, oh, look, he messed up, ha, ha, ha. No, he's going to say, these paths did not work for these reasons, forcing me to make a different assumption. Yeah. That's the enterprise of science. And if it delays your PhD, you got your whole friggin' life. You just, you, you'll delay a year of income. I don't, it's, it's, don't worry about that. What are you, what's your hurry? You're going to be doing this your whole life. Celebrate it.